Hopkins. I'm visiting from Aarhus University. Uh, yes, I'm a PhD student there. And I'll be talking about Davenport Schinzel sequences, uh, generalization of them. Um, I'm normally a Schinzel, as far as I know. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, it's different from Schnitzel. Uh, something's not working here. Uh, do I have to do something to get this to work? <laughs> All right. So uh, I'll start with a geometric application. Um, so lower envelopes, we have a set of curves in the plane. They're graphs of functions. And the lower envelope of this set of curves will be just the minimum at all x coordinates, that bold area there. And what we want to study is the complexity of the lower envelope, uh, which is how many uh, segments, how many pieces uh, are involved in this lower envelope. And uh, what we can do is assign a label for each of the curves, A, B, C, D, in this example. And we can write out a string representation of the lower envelope just by reading off from left to right uh, what curve does the piece come from. So D, B, A, etc. So we get this string representation of the lower envelope. And um, we can look at properties of this string representation. Uh, of course, this is going to depend on what, what uh, on the properties of our input uh, curves. Um, so one example is if we consider our curves being uh, polynomials, uh, say cubic functions, then one property of the resulting string representation will be that we cannot have a subsequence of the form a, b, a, b, a. This is because we know that cubic functions intersect at most three times, but if we had a, b, a, b, a as a subsequence that would imply that the curves a and b need to intersect at least four times, because <coughs> each time we switch from a to b or from b to a, that implies we must have an intersection between the two. So these strings are what we call davenport Schinzel sequences. Uh, so what are they pr more precisely? Uh, they are repetition-free sequences uh, of letters. Um, so no two adjacent characters can be equal. And also, um, uh, and for a Davenport Schinzel sequence of order s, we cannot have a subsequence, an alternating subsequence a b a b a b uh, of size of length s plus two. So in this example here, we have a b a c a c b c. Um, it is not a Davenport Schinzel sequence of order two because we have a bunch of a b a b subsequences a b a b b c b c. A, C, A, C. These are all A, B, A, B subsequences. Uh, however, it is a Davenport Schinzel sequence of order three uh, because there's no A, B, A, B, A, B. Um, and in so fact, the, the S plus two refers to the individual letters. Yeah, that's the right. Uh, yeah, the, the length is the number of characters in the pattern. Yeah, that's right. Uh, th this example here is actually the longest um, David Port Chinsel sequence with three uh, letters of order three. Uh, yeah, and we'll see. We'll see it later. So S could be even or odd. It doesn't really matter. Like uh, yeah, a that's right. A A B A A B A B. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the older one is like you don't have uh, A B A. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so this uh, study was introduced in the 80s, and now this is our understanding of it. Uh, we have what we call sharp bounds for all orders, and they look like this, and they're all very close to, they're all, all linear or very close to linear. This, uh, this function here is the inverse Ackerman function, um, and this, these bounds were finalized in 2013 uh, by Seth Petty, he took the last step um, we call these sharp bounds uh, because they're tight up to the definition of the inverse Ackerman function. Because everyone, everyone who writes a paper with inver inverse Ackerman function tends to make up their own definition of it uh, just to make it easier for their proof. Um, so yeah, uh, so the constant factor in front of the inverse Ackerman function will change depending on which function you use. Um, 
but yeah, these are basically tight up into up to that definition. So most people say that's good enough. Um, and these uh, these give upper bounds on the complexity of the lower envelope of degree s polynomials. However, uh, we don't know any lower bounds on any interesting lower bounds on the complexity of of degree s polynomials. So it could be that the lower envelope of polynomials with constant degree is in fact linear. Um, yeah, before I continue, I'll just uh, let's just do some warm up exercises. Just but the, the property you're using for the polynomials is just their degree determines how many times they intersect. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, there <laughs> there are many more properties that we could potentially exploit. Yes, many, many more. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's see uh, see how we get this these linear bounds for order one and two. Uh, so order one, uh, let's see, our, the first character in the string without loss of generality, let's say it's an A. Can you turn on the left, on the, on the left of the board? Yeah. On the left of the board. Left of the board. Oh, okay. here we go. <laughs> um, yes, and then the second character, it uh, cannot be an A, uh, because then we would have a repetition, right? So uh, without loss of generality, let's say it's a B. The next character after that cannot be an A because then we would have A, B, A. That's what we're forget forbidding, by the way. We're forbidding patterns A, B, A. Yeah, this is order one. So we're forbidding A, B, A. Um, so we can't have A, we can't have B, so it must be C. The next character, character cannot be A, B, or C, D, etc. So yes, basically what we're saying is each character can only occur once. Uh, so that's how you get the N bound for order one. For order two, we're forbidding A, B, A, B. Uh, so what we're going to do is again start at the start of the string um, and say there's an A at the start of the string. Let's find all the other occurrences of A. There might be more. Now we know that there must be some other character between the first two A's, right? So let's look at the first character and without loss of generality, it's a B. Now what can we say about the location of all the other B's in this string? Well, we know that there cannot be, be any B's in here because then we have A, B, A, B. Can't be here, can't be here. All the B's have to occur in this, in this gap. And actually, if you think about it more, uh, the alphabets of all of these substrings must be disjoint, right? So we can um, we can do this. Uh, so what we're going to do is build a tree, and how we do that is we look at the first character in a string and make a node for that character, and then we're going to recurse in each of the uh, each of the substrings that are formed by splitting on that character to make new nodes. So there's going to be a B node here, and it's going to be, become a child of that node. And say we have a C, 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 D. So we'll have a C node, the D node, and we must terminate eventually, so let's just fill it in. F and G. All right, uh, so um, now you can observe that we can charge each occurrence of an A to an edge in this tree. Because there, yeah, there must be something between the two A's. Um, however, uh, that that works except for the very last A because we might not have anything after the last A. So we can't charge that to a, to one of A's children via the edges, but we can charge it to A's node instead. 
So what that means is the number of characters in our string will be at most the number of edges in this tree plus the number of nodes in this tree, which is going to be n plus n minus 1, which is 2n minus 1. All right, uh, let's move on. Uh, so, so the standard problem of Davenport Schinsel sequences is, is essentially solved, so we're going to move on to looking at generalized Davenport Schinsel sequences. Uh, so we can generalize them in a couple of ways. Uh, we can allow... Show us the simple examples. Show us order three. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I will not, but... Uh, uh, I'll show you some other proofs later on <laughs> in the talk. Um, so for uh, we can forbid ar uh, uh, for uh, we can forbid arbitrary patterns. Uh, we can consider patterns with a higher w with more characters in its alphabet. Uh, so for example, n-shaped patterns generalize this ABAB pattern to larger alphabets. We go from A up to C, for example, back down to A and up to C. Um, and these patterns have applications in bounding the number of edges in some geometric graphs. Um, you can also consider forbidding multiple patterns, not just one pattern. So for example, we can forget, forbid A, B, A, B, A, B, as well as this thing. And these two patterns, if we forbid those two, we get uh, an application uh, of bounding the complexity of the union of fat triangles in some way. Um, so, so far we've only seen geometric applications, but also there are some applications to, for example, um, data structures uh, bounding the running time of, of data structures. Uh, we can basically um, output a log of the operations that we do uh, that the data, data structure performs and then show that certain operations cannot be performed in some, in some pattern and then we get a bound on the overall running time of the operations of that data structure. Um, so basically there are quite a few uh, applications of these generalized Davenport Chinsel sequences and of course we don't know all of the applications yet uh, so it would be nice to get a theory of of what are the patterns that result in linear sequences and uh, the patterns and the sets of patterns that give us uh, linear sequences so that's what we're going to look at uh, so we've seen that um, the uh, Davenport tensile sequences of order two are linear. Uh, in fact, every n-shaped pattern on its own is linear. Uh, this weird sequence was recently proved to be linear. <laughs> a B A C A C B. It's a bit different than the example that we saw earlier. Um, You're forbidding such a thing, right? Yeah, yeah. This list of things that you forbid. Yeah, these what are. An n-shaped pattern. An n-shaped one. Uh, you're saying every n -shape. What is the definition of an n-shaped pattern? Yeah, so uh, you pick an alphabet size. So say alphabet, alphabet size of five. Then you start at the first letter of the alphabet, go up to the highest alphabet, uh, highest letter of the alphabet, go back down to the first. To the first. And then back up to the last. What so. Do you like this? Uh, all the way down. No, all the yeah. You doesn't go, matter, you go all the way. Hmm? In the definition, we go all the way down. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So A B A C A C B C. Uh, this is the longest Davenport tensile sequence of order three on three characters, and on its own, its complexity is somewhere between um, n alpha n and and 2 to the alpha n. Um, if we get rid of the last character here, then... then this is linear. 
Um, and we'll see another pattern soon. Uh, also, there are some operators that uh, that operate on patterns and give you uh, other patterns that are that are linear. So this doubling operation, if we take a pattern and double it, it means that we repeat every internal character in the pattern. And this will preserve linearity for n-shaped patterns. Um, there's also an operation called embedding. So if you have two linear patterns, u and v, and uh, they have disjoint alphabets, and u happens to have uh, a repeated character inside somewhere, then we could Im embed v into u at the location where the two, where we have the two repeated characters. And then we get another linear pattern. Also, if we have two permutations of the same alphabet, then pi 1 double pi 2 is, is linear. And what I'm basically trying to see, say here is that we know a whole bunch of random stuff about linearity, and there's no real, we don't yet have an actual good understanding of, of what is linear and what is not. Uh, what, what is doubling? Is a, a, B, a, B. Yeah, so doubling is, uh, so the input to the function is a pattern, and the output is another pattern, where we've repeated each of the internal characters in the pattern. So all the characters, have the first and last, now occur twice. Mm -hmm. Is it standard terminology to doubling, or your own terminology? Uh, this is terminology from from the papers that I've read <laughs> about it. Yes, not my terminology. Okay, so so where are we going to tackle uh, the linear? Uh, the linearity problem. So um, recall that the lowest order nonlinear Davenport Schinzel sequence is A B A B A, um, and we're going to ask what else must we must we forbid to get back to linear? And um, Seth uh, Petty has a conjecture that um, we can forbid in addition to A B A B A this pattern here A B A C A B C. So this is again not either of these. But it is yeah. A, B, C. This one on its own is uh, an alpha n. So this pattern on its own is very slightly superlinear. A, B, A, B, A is also very slightly superlinear. And his conjecture is basically saying that um, they're, they allow superlinear sequences in sufficiently different ways that um, they'll cancel out the the linear uh, the superlinear sequences that the other pattern let through. So there's a synergy between these two patterns. Um, so this is why he makes this conjecture. And this is uh, one of the problems I was working on initially. Um, and then, uh, and, and as I was working on this, I saw that. Um, it seemed like all the techniques that I, that I was trying to use uh, could also be applied uh, to this slightly stronger problem, which is that uh, a stronger conjecture being that AB, ABA as well as ABAC, ACBC is linear. Uh, so that's, again, this pattern up here. So this is a stronger conjecture because this pattern here is less restrictive than this pattern here. Um, but uh, both of these conjectures re remain conjectures. And uh, what we'll actually be pr uh, proving is that a generalization of these two patterns here uh, to a family of patterns is indeed linear. So the first member of the family is ABABA, which we're now familiar with, ABACACBC, the third, ABACACDCDBD. Is it clear? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so I call these capped interleaved triples. Um, so what we uh, so this is a triple. You just lay out <coughs> three characters with one space between each, and then you can interleave another triple, like so. Interleave another triple. Let's do another. Why not? And then 
you finish by capping both ends of the triple with one more character. So this would be the fourth member of the family. Um, are they all individually super linear? Um, e I mean, they must be, yes. I don't know, you're, you're excluding an infinite family? Yes. Uh -huh. Each one is less and less restrictive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you explain the meaning of parentheses on connection of the two? This? Ah, uh, no, no, no. Oh, <laughs> the, these, these curly braces? Uh, so, yeah, it, it, what I'm saying here is if we forbid both of these patterns. Yeah. Right, so we're forbidding an infinite family of patterns and showing that uh, we obtain a, uh, only linear sequences. Um, so this has some applications in proving that some exotic families of curves have linear lower envelopes. So if your curves can be cut into few enough pseudo segments, so that's just a set of uh, curves that pairwise intersect at most once, um, then they have linear lower envelopes. Uh, for example, if you consider um, some quadratic splines, which are uh, only consist of two pieces and they're rotationally symmetric. So basically things that look very much like cubic functions but aren't quite cubic functions, then they have lower envelopes. Um, yes, uh, but of course the cubic function lower envelope problem is still, uh, still open. So uh, let's move on to the proof. So what we're going to want to do eventually is, is uh, proved by induction on the number of letters in the alphabet, something. Um, so we'll be deleting a character from the alphabet, so let's see what exactly that means. Uh, we have a string here, and say we want to delete the character C. So we remove all of the Cs, and now we end up with another string. But the problem is, now we've introduced some repetitions, and if we want to apply some kind of induction hypothesis, then that's not going to work out, because we cannot have uh, <laughs> repetitions in our string, so we can just uh, delete um, one of each pair of similar elements. Uh, so we end up with a smaller string once again, and we've reduced the length of our string by two times the multiplicity of C in the string, right? OK, so here is our the high-level inductive proof. Um, we're going to show that if there are no capped interleaved triples in a string, then its length is at most four times n, where n is the size of the alphabet. All right, so what we're going to do is delete a character with multiplicity less than or equal to two. This will reduce the length of our string by at most four by the previous slide. Um, now we want to apply the induction hypothesis to the string, so we have to check that it has no repetitions. We already checked that, and we have to check that there's no cap interleave triples and that's clear because the property of having of not having a pattern is closed under deletions of characters so we can apply the induction hypothesis uh, that means the remainder will have length less than or equal to 4 times n minus 1 and thus the original has length less than or equal to 4 times n but in this pattern the letter b can ap b appear only twice right b mm. Uh, B, yeah, B is always twice in the pattern. Right, so I, mean, I can see that like letter A or C, all these other letters can, I mean, all, all these other letters appear at least three times mm. in this pattern, so removing the character with multiplicity less than or equal to two doesn't change that, but for B, are you? Um, right. But this is a forbidden pattern. This is a pattern which yeah. is not in the string. Now we are talking about the string itself. Mm -hmm. Right, but uh, oh, so so maybe your your problem is that it, uh, well, I mean, so I skipped the main part of the proof, which is proving that there is a character with multiplicity less than or equal to two. Is that uh, what you're? Okay, so, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so that's that's of course the what we need to fill in now. Uh, 
prove that there is such a character that, such a character to delete. Do, is it clear if, if that's true, then we're fine? Ah. Okay, so what we'll do is assume towards contradiction that every character has multiplicity greater than or equal to three, and then try to arrive at a contradiction. And the contradiction that we'll, we'll arrive at is that there must be a capped interleaved triple. So we've reformulated our problem to this. We want to show that if all characters have mul multiplicity greater than or equal to three, then there must be a capped interleaved triple in our string. And in fact, we're going to immediately reduce to the case where all characters have multiplicity exactly equal to three. Um, so how do we do that? Say we have a character with more than three occurrences, then we can remove any of the internal occurrences. Uh, so say we have an A here, we can delete it. What if it introduces a repetition? That would be a problem, but if it introduces a repetition, then we have two Bs on either side of it. So we have A, B, A, B, A, right? So we're done in that case. Otherwise, we remove as many internal A's as we need to get down to three A's, do that for all the characters. Um, and then we'll find a capped interleaved triple in the smaller string, which implies that there must have been a capped interleaved triple in, in our original string. So all characters have multiplicity exactly equal to three, prove that there exists a capped interleaved triple. That's what we need to do. All right, so uh, to prove this, we're going to uh, build a chain. Um, what does that mean? We're going to start with the very first character in our string, this leftmost A, that's the start of our chain. And currently the end of our chain is the third rightmost occurrence of A. And as long as the end of the chain is surrounded by two of the same character, we're going to extend the chain, like so. So now the end of the chain was surrounded by two Bs, so the third B becomes the new end of the chain. And this might occur a few times, but eventually this process has to terminate uh, because our string is of finite length. So it can terminate in two different ways. Either the end of the chain will be surrounded by two different characters, x and y here, or uh, we could end up building a chain and then uh, the end of the chain fits snugly between our first two A's, in which case we have a cyclic chain. All right. And these are the only two different ways that, that this process can terminate. And so we're going to uh, consider both of these cases separately. Uh, let's start with the chain forms a cycle case. In the case when you had the first A, how did, why did you pick the last A? I mean, in all other ones, you were two next to a letter, and then you picked the one that's not next to that letter. But um, then you, you started with the A, so yep. none, none of them are special. Uh, right. Uh, well, I mean, uh, we always pick the the outer occurrences of the character. Uh, that's what's consistent between all the steps, right? So it could be the first day or the last day. Uh, yes, but we we need to we need our, the start of our chain to be the first day uh, later on. So what <laughs> if the last A is the last letter of the string? If the last, uh, then we can, uh, if the last, yeah. That's the first case. Then, then that's, uh, yeah, so it can terminate in three ways, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> yes. Um, is that right? Yeah, uh, that, that's definitely an easy case. Uh, yeah. So that, that, that'll be handled by the case where different characters are at the end of the chain. Um, all right, so, so we're considering the cyclic case right now. So we have a whole bunch of groups of three consecutive characters where the outer characters are always equal. 
So what we're going to do to help visualize this is build a graph. We're going to make a node for each group and label it with the outer character from each group. And we'll draw an edge from node A to the group that the third occurrence of A occurs in and do this for all nodes. So of course we get a cycle because this is just a, a representation of the chaining process that, that we did. And now what we want to do is show that certain subgraphs in this, in this graph imply the presence of, of capped interleaved triples. So in particular, uh, if we start at some node, take one hop to the left, and then take a hop to the right, which goes past, at or past, where we started, then we must have A, B, A, B, A. We must have a capped interleaved triple with one, with just one interleaved triple. Um, if we start at a node, take one hop to the left, take a small hop to the right that doesn't pass where we started, but then the second hop to the right does pass where we started, then we have the second member of our family. And what we're saying in general is that um, if we take one hop to the left and then take a sequence of hops to the right that eventually passes where we started, then we must have some capped interleaved triple. Okay, so if we go back to our graph, it's clear that one of these must exist because we can start at the leftmost node that points left. So that means we'll take a hop to the left. And now every node in between must point right. So we will take right jumps until we eventually pass back over. So this shows that. Uh, what if D is the last node of the cycle? Yeah, so uh, it can either pass it or arrive back at it. If it arrived back at it, this A would be in between these two Bs, and we'd still have A, B, A, B, A. Yeah. All right, so that handles the cyclic case. And uh, now let's move on to the case where the end of the chain was surrounded by two different characters. Uh, so here we are. This is the end of the chain, which was surrounded by two different characters. Um, and now what we're going to do is uh, build a chain in the opposite direction. So this is going to be the start of our backwards chain. And as we build this chain, we're going to have slightly stronger properties to deal with because we know that we are starting from the end of another chain. So in particular, we already know that these uh, two E's here are separated by only one character because when we were building the chain in the forward direction, uh, they, were sur they were surrounding the end of, of, a chain, of the chain in the forward direction. All right, so now we ask, are the two characters on either side of the end of the backward chain, are they the same? If so, we extend the chain further. And again, we know that the third occurrence of D now must occur just one space away from this D the middle D here. And this can happen multiple times. And again, this process must terminate. Either uh, the C will be surrounded by two different characters, or we might end up going back to the start of the string, where there is no character to the left of the A, but there is a character here. And this is the only case where the space between uh, these two characters can be greater than one, but that's fine. All right, so what are we going to do now? Um, we're done building our backwards chain. And now what we're going to do is remove everything that you see up here, all of these characters, except for these X, this X and this Y. And uh, we're going to apply an induction hypothesis onto, onto the resulting string. Uh, so. What do we need to know about the resulting string? We need to know that um, every character has multiplicity three in that string after deleting these things. 
Uh, that's clear because we're deleting all three of a character or none of a character. So all of the remaining characters will still have all three of their occurrences. That's fine. Uh, we also have to know that the string is repetition free. So we have to check, will we introduce a repetition by deleting these characters? So we can delete this E without introducing repetition for sure. Uh, we can delete this A because it's either at the start of the string and we can always delete the first uh, character in the string. That's fine. Or um, it's surrounded by two different characters, in which case we can remove it without introducing a repetition. Uh, this sequence of characters is contiguous, so we just need to check if these two characters here and here are equal. If they are, then we have a captain to leave triple. Right? Because this thing here with the A's, B's, C's, and D's, and E's, that's an interleave triple of size 5, I guess. And then if there are indeed two B's here, then that serves as the cap for the capped interleave triple. So in that case, we're done. Otherwise, we can delete all of these characters without introducing repetition, and we can apply our induction hypothesis. So we delete at least one character, leave behind at least two characters, x and y, and then we're done by induction on the size of the alphabet. So, so wait, but if you delete the e, then you get a double d. And just, uh, um, yeah, so we're deleting absolutely everything, though. We're deleting the d's as well. We're deleting a, b, c, d, and d. So we only have to check that there's no repetition here around the starting a, no repetition after the final E, and no repetition on either side of this contiguous block. Right. Then we can just quickly check the base case for n equals 2. Between the second D and the first E. Right here. Um, let's see. Um, no, we cannot because we. This is the case as we're building the chain backwards, right? So we only continue building the chain if the two characters on either side of this E are equal. In which case, the chain builds like this, and now we know that there's nothing in between. Third D and the second E. Uh, we know that when we were building the chain in the forward direction that this D was surrounded by two of the same character and they were two E's. So it's crucial that we're building the chain backwards from the end of a chain that we built forwards. That's why everything ends up being cont contiguous. So when you build the chain backwards, you don't just do the, the forward construction backwards. You actually also apply the rule that you check if there are two identical circuits. Yeah, yeah we're doing, we're doing uh, the chain building process is the same in both directions. It's just the properties of the resulting, stronger properties, uh, stronger properties on, the resulting uh, on the resulting chain, yeah. So you still need to show us a chain, the case where this stops because the two symbols are different. Um, this stops because the, uh, yeah, so if, if they're, di if they're different, uh, on either side here, we can delete this character, right? That's all we need. We need that in any case, when this ends in any way, that we can remove this character without introducing a repetition. So it can end either by getting back to the first character or by being surrounded by different characters. And either way, we can delete it. All right, that concludes the proof. Uh, so some open problems. So I think the most accessible open problem in the area is what is the uh, it, are these two patterns linear? <laughs> a, B, A, B, A, and A, B, A, C, A, B, C. Um, 
Yeah, but in general, any results which help in characterizing what are the linear patterns and sets of patterns are interesting, and there's certainly lots of different open problems to tackle there. Uh, I'm very much interested in this, this problem of bounding the complexity of the lower envelope of cubic functions. Um, so one attack that I wanted to do on this problem was to consider the case of small constant n computationally. Uh, so check if there are any Davenport schnitzel sequences of order 3 that can't be realized with polynomials. <coughs> so uh, I did the case of n equals 3 by hand and was able to realize all of them. And then with the help of a computer program, I was able to show that, unfortunately, for n equals 4 also, uh, all of the sequences are realizable. Uh, for n equals 5, seems intractable. Um, well, 6 would be intractable. I think 5 is a possibility. But anyways, um, uh, the plan was if I was able to find a small enough uh, unreali unrealizable sequence to use that as a forbidden pattern along with ABABA to try to prove something about arbitrary n. But it's looking like this approach might not, uh, in the end, uh, work out. But yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks.